Hi everyone, welcome to Empowering Homeschool Conversations. Glad to have you back with us, or if you're new, just joining us um, for the first time, we're glad to have you as well. Um, if you're joining us live, this is the awesome part of this. I just want you to be able to share this. Well, of course, if you're, you're watching and it's recorded too, share it as well, but um, bring your friends along. We're gonna talk about eclectic homeschooling tonight, and I'll talk a little bit about that as I introduce our guest and, um, and just what we're talking about this month is different homeschooling approaches, methodologies, so that you get a better understanding of what is there out there and what choices do I have? And that's what the awesome part of eclectic homeschooling is, is as Julia is going to teach us, is that it's a mix of everything and you take the best and you leave the rest. Um, and so um, welcome, Julia. I um, I'm glad that you are with us tonight, and thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so is your head spinning with homeschooling lingo, Charlotte Mason, classical, unschooling, traditional unit studies? Are you trying to pick and choose, but you just don't know what would best fit your family, or do you tend to lean to thinking outside the box, or do you feel stuck in the box without any other option? Here's the truth. One style doesn't fit all, just as we tell our parents with special needs kids. <laughs> there isn't one based on your child's diagnoses. Depending on your child's age, grade, learning challenges, or interests, you can a la carte with purpose in this session tonight. Julia is going to share with us, um, based on what she's done in teaching her own children and through designing um, the Biblio Plan uh, curriculum, that it's possible to thoughtfully pick and choose a little bit of this, a little bit of that with success. So, um, so we're glad, so glad to have you here tonight, Julia. And, um, and I also want to let our audience know that um, Julia would like to, to get your questions, but we're going to hold them to the end and we're going to do a Q&A session at the end. So, um, so make sure that as she's talking and bringing up things, if you have a question, feel free to throw them in the feed. We'll kind of go through them, but, um, but we are going to hold them till, till the end of, um, of her presentation and um and fit those in so um so thanks again julia for joining us and as we get started you know i always ask my guests tell us a little bit about you because that always plays into the the factor of you know what you talk about and why you talk about and, and really how you've learned to do what you do <laughs> Well, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm from Virginia, so this is nine o'clock late for me. So yes. yeah, if I fall asleep, no, I'm not going to fall asleep. So, um, I actually graduated with a nursing degree, a little practical nursing degree. Um, and I loved nursing. I loved my patients, but I was uh, not really good with the paperwork. Oh. Um, I hated it. I hated, um, I hated all things that have to do with paper and writing because I'm left-handed and I have the worst oh. handwriting in the world. Um, yeah. So I I got out of nursing after a year of um, going for my RN, hmm. and I changed directions. My mom was a teacher, and I decided I was going to follow in her footsteps. Uh -huh. um, so I got my education degree, and mm -hmm. I absolutely loved it. I love teaching. I love kids. I um, you know just really enjoyed it. But I'm a renegade. Uh. I, um, I don't follow very well. Um, books. I kind of think, always think outside the box. Mm -hmm. And so as a teacher, I was always, you know, pressing up against, I don't want to use this curriculum. I want to try something different. Uh -huh. um, I try to teach from a teacher's guide. I, it was boring to me. Yeah. Um, so when I was teaching school and I taught for a number of years, I rarely ever cracked open the teacher's guide. I just winged it. <laughs> I went with my passions and my heart. Right. Um, and it was fun. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, you know, but it required a lot more planning because yes. you know, if you're winging it, you've got to think through more mm -hmm. than just reading what someone else is telling me how to do it. Yeah. Um, but my students benefited. It was better for them. Um, right. I taught school for quite a number of years and then I um, decided to try, um, I, try, I tried to take part in a missions program. So I went hmm. for um, nine months and I spent time in Belize, Central America. Wow. And that was a that was a pretty profound um, experience for me. Mm. When I came back, I decided that I wanted to go into missions, huh. and um, I kind of thought, well, I'm gonna um, I'd like to get my master's in education, and then I could go and teach in a school 
overseas or, or, you know, be a principal or do something like that. Right. Um, so I, I was single at the time. And so it was kind of like the, you know, everything was open for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I started seminary and um, the very first class that I took was Old Testament. Okay. And I thought, um, this is going to be really boring because <laughs> I've been in church all my life. And what else are they going to tell me about Old Testament that I haven't mm -hmm. already learned? Um, that class was life changing for me. Mm. The professor was phenomenal and he taught scripture in a way that nobody had ever taught before to mm. me. And it just, it was just life changing. I, um, I ended up taking every single class that I could possibly take that he offered. Um, huh. I ended up with a master's in old Testament, wow. um, pastoral ministries and mm. counseling which was very different from Christian education. I never. Right, did. exactly. I <laughs> a little tangent there. <laughs> last there. I didn't actually know what I was going to do with my degree because while I was in seminary, I actually got mm. married. Um, and so that uh -huh. kind of upended my, I'm going single to the, to the mission field kind of thing. So um, I, by the time I had graduated and was married, it was kind of like, why did I do this? And that kind of, that question kind of hung over me for a couple years. Um, so anyway, yeah. So, so tell us a little bit more about your family then. Well, I have a, um, I have an awesome husband. Um, he loves the Lord. He loves his family in that mm. order. Um, <laughs> he's an awesome singer. He, he plays the guitar. He's just very talented. Yeah. We have, um, five children. We have four boys and a, and a girl. Um, our two oldest are biological and they are both, um, out of the house, although mm -hmm. I do get to see them a lot. So it's not too bad. Um, <laughs> our three youngers, we call them our littles. Mm -hmm. They're um, all three adopted. We adopted them from Ukraine, um, three different, uh, separate adoptions. Okay. Uh -huh. um, the oldest, the boys are both 16. They're mm -hmm. four months apart. They, I'm sorry. They're four wow. weeks apart. Uh -huh. And, um, our little girl is nine. So then my husband and I together, um, we actually co-write a history literature curriculum yeah. called the Wheel Plan. So how did that get started? <laughs> um, so when my two older sons were um, starting school, we put, well, when my oldest was going into school, we put him in Christian school because I was an educator and I was not going to homeschool. I just was not. I was very against it. <laughs> I there said was, that too. <laughs> really? There were yes. a lot of people in my world at that point that were homeschooling there were a few but mm. there wasn't you know this was this was my oldest is 26 so this was a while back yeah. um and i was i had i the mantra of children need to be socialized was a very very big deal and it wasn't right. a big deal to me and so i put them in a pop christian school but the christian school that i put them in was very strict mm. was very much put your feet on the floor and fold your hands in front of your lap and and you know very right. not creative everything that was goes against me mm. um, as soon as we had him there i hated it but he was so social and he fell in love with all the kids in his class and he was making all these friends and so we didn't want to pull him out right and he hung out with both boys there for a while mm. and then he hit the wall in about fourth grade uh, um mm -hmm. he got a teacher that was super mean <clears throat> Um, super oh. strict and he just started crying every day and after about the oh. fourth week of school I asked him I said do you want mommy to homeschool you and I just kind of threw that out rhetorically thinking that right. he was going to say no way yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> he started crying and he said please please mommy homeschool mm. me and so that kind of was like okay so we pulled him out and um, so we got jumped right into the deep end of homeschooling because we weren't we didn't think it through it was just like yeah. we just did it Mm -hmm. And so the next thing you know, I've got to, to homeschool these peoples in my, that I have not planned on. I didn't have their, I didn't know what curriculum was out there. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, you know, it was just a very shocking um, thing. So at first we stuck with what um, the school had. I okay. brought home their books and I started out with that. And that lasted for all of a matter of a couple weeks. Honestly, <laughs> I just, I just am like, I'm just a renegade. And so well, it's really, probably what a lot of people did with COVID too. It's, it's kind of the same scenario. Yep. You, yeah. You get it and you're like, I think yeah. I'm going to go differently because this mm. isn't, I don't really like this. And right. So, um, I started looking at different things. And as time went on over the next year, mm -hmm. um, I went with just a little bit of this and a little bit of that exchanging. Um, mm. And I stumbled during that period upon a little guide um, that lined up reading history 
with reading quality literature books, um, living books. And it was uh-huh. called Biblio Plan, which is Latin for book plan. Oh. It meant starting an ancient history, which mm-hmm. with my seminary degree, I was like, oh, this is like so cool because now we're watching Bible history and ancient history yeah. going together, which is what I was trained in. Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden I'm doing it with my kids and it was just a really cool God thing. Um, wow. We watched the God story unfold and then, and we just kept at it. Um, a few years later, I was asked to teach at our local co-op. Hmm. And, mm-hmm. um, I, and so I took that little guide in, I started using it in my class. And um, it just so happened that the owner who owned that guide had a child in my class. And hmm. being the, the kind of person that I am, I had taken that guide and I had was changing it. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was ripping the open sequence and I didn't like this. And I, so I was, I was doing all kinds of stuff to her guide. Mm-hmm. And like, her little boy was coming home with, with maps and question pages and all kinds of stuff that that wasn't part of the curriculum but that right was, you know, he's looking at this going i really like what you're doing she was from texas and so she had this awesome texas accent and she said hey can we partner and um so that kind of got us going and my i you know i started writing for her and then we started partnering together and then eventually wow. we ended up buying the company from her so that's kind of how all of that happened wow. so here we are that's really cool. So, I mean, so you really were crafting and creating curriculum before you even thought you were making curriculum. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> so, so you're here tonight to help other moms do the exact same thing, and I'm so excited for you to share. So, so where, where do you even start when you start thinking about, you know, how do we do this? So I think you need to start with just understanding what, is out there and 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 right um, most of what's out there fall or fall under um certain philosophies of homeschooling mm-hmm. um there's the traditional philosophy there's unit studies there's mm-hmm. classical charlotte mason and then there's unschooling free spirit those are kinds of words uh, that you're going to hear all over the, all the time right um and so traditional is if you're coming out of public school that's going to be what your kids were doing for the most part yeah Um, Mm -hmm. it's what most of us are familiar with it's you read the text you answer Mm -hmm. the questions you memorize facts you take tests yeah Um, the vast majority of curriculum follow traditional method if you went Mm -hmm. to public school or a traditional christian school chances are you use traditional curriculum right um unit studies are also pretty familiar um, and again, if they came out of public school, if you've come out of public school, or if you're using traditional curriculum, a lot of times they have built in t- unit studies or unit studies is just a part of it. Right. So unit studies caught you, you pick a certain subject and you zoom in on it. We do mm. this for science when we study a unit on mammals, or mm-hmm. we do this for history when we do a unit on pilgrims or the Egyptians. Mm-hmm. Um, if schools stray from traditional, it is usually in the direction of you doing unit studies. Ah. Um, classical is something that popped up right before I started homeschooling and it, and it, it mm. was pretty much started with a book called, um, the well-trained mind by Susan Wise Bauer. Yes. Um, I remember and reading that is on teaching children to think critically, mm-hmm. um, during the elementary years, children learn facts and memorize them mm-hmm. in, the middle, in the middle school, children learn to think logically based on those facts. And then in high school, they formulate what they believe and then are able to express their beliefs in speaking and writing. Mm -hmm. Um, Classical education, history is its guiding tool. So with literature books being, they kind of go together. Um, And it's kind of a living book kind of idea. Mm. Um, History is taught in order from ancients to modern Mm -hmm. and literature and the other subjects, science, math, languages are all tied into it. Um, and then classical education is considered is to be is kind of very language focused. So that's kind of yeah. your classical um, approach. Charlotte mm-hmm. Mason is and Charlotte Mason did, wasn't really a keyword when my kids were my oldest were going through. So I didn't mm-hmm. ever even hear understand it. Yeah, until we had a whole hour last week where we did yeah. just did Charlotte Mason. So yeah, yeah it, mm-hmm. it, it was it was it was it's newer. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's another style of learning that is based around doing rather than just sitting and listening. Mm -hmm. Um, The emphasis is on reading living books, study and history in order. Both that that, both of those are actually like Uh two of them kind of go together in some ways. Mm -hmm. Charlotte Mason believes in short lessons 
in learning to write through narration and dictation. Um, they do a lot of music study, nature study, other hands-on mm -hmm. learning. It's very child focused. Um, so, and it's, it's, a, it's a great option. Um, right. And then there's, there's the unschooling and people think you can't, unschooling is like, that's not schooling, okay? But unschooling is actually a type of homeschooling. Yes, we spent um, a whole hour on that too, a couple okay. weeks ago. So, so, so yes, if you want more, I, I interviewed um, Dr. Peter Gray from that wrote Free to Learn. Um, fascinating interview. So definitely go back and watch that if you want to learn more about unschooling. <laughs> it's, it's fundamental drive is very student led. Mm -hmm. So, um, or, or child focused as opposed to teacher or parent led. So if the child is interested in rockets, then they're encouraged to study and learn everything they can about rockets. And then you as a mom are coming alongside and you are creating math lessons and writing lessons and history mm -hmm. lessons that all go in with that rocket focus so that mm -hmm. you're just pulling it all together for that child. Um, so those are kind of the five basic types of, um, of philosophies that um, most of the curriculum fall under one um, or the other of those. Right, but it, it tends to be that I think the longer you homeschool, you kind of start pulling from every single one, you know, and and yet it seems so confusing because am I covering everything? You know, am I doing it right? We have the, you, you have a lot of trepidations about you know doing that because you think well if I'm not following a plan I'm not doing it right, um, and so what do you have to share? Um, about that it is okay to okay so um let me start by saying i'm a soup maker i i, I <laughs> okay. didn't be, but i've i've turned into a soup maker um and i'm the kind of soup maker like a curriculum maker which is like i wing it i don't follow recipes i tend to think what what would be good here mm -hmm. um so i throw in a little bit of this and a little bit of that um and my attitude is if you add enough spices you can make really tasty soup out of a bunch of bits and pieces that you can find. Mm -hmm. So um, back That's during true. the Depression, um, homeless people would create community stews, and they were called mm. mulligan stews. And um, yeah. they, they made them with whatever they had on hand. So the first mulligan stew is mentioned in an article in 1900 hmm. um, from Portland, England. And um, in the article, it talks about five or six hobos joined together. They're going to make a mulligan stew. Hmm. One of them builds a fire and rustles up a can. Mm -hmm. Another has to proc procure the meat. Another one finds the potatoes. One fella pledges himself to obtain bread and still another has to furnish onion, salt, and pepper. Mm -hmm. If a chicken can be stolen, so much the better. This is all in the article. The whole <laughs> outfit is placed in the can and boiled until it is done. So they've made a mulligan stew with a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Huh. That sounds a, a bit like eclectic homeschooling. <laughs> so, yeah. It, it, so, so how do we translate that then into what we're doing with teaching our kids? In my, in my opinion, um, no one philosophy can cover all the bases for all of our kids. Yeah, Boxes, when we so buy true. curriculum out of a box, and, and, you know, they're appealing. They're super easy. You know, you can pick your right. child, right? Mm -hmm. you can write a check and mm -hmm. boom, you have everything you need for that entire year. You're done. You, yeah. you can just say, I'm going to pick this company's curriculum. I'm going to get their second grade material and mm -hmm. you just get that box and you're done. Um, those boxes are nice. They contain everything you need for the year. They right. save time. They're trusted and true. They appeal to mm. your philosophy for the most part, because you're not usually going to buy a box that doesn't appeal to some kind of philosophy. Right. They're usually thorough, and they usually cover everything that you need. And the mm. vast majority of items in the box are going to line up with your worldview. So that, mm -hmm. so that that is following a box. But what happens is what many people come to realize is that not all the items in that box are going to meet your child's needs. Exactly. One side does yep. one size does not always fit all. Mm -hmm. There are parts in that box that you don't like. Right. Your kids don't like and yet you've <laughs> spent money and you're stuck with it and you feel guilty using it. Not using oh, it. Oh, yes. If yep. the box mm -hmm. contains only traditional material, then your child who loves to move and experiment and get their mm -hmm. hands messy is going to die of boredom. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> if the box contains only literature books, 
Mm -hmm. and focuses on language and higher level thinking, then your child who loves unit studies is going to drown. Yeah. If that mm -hmm. box contains only unit studies, then your child who loves to read and think critically and wants to see things line up chronologically is going to be miserable. Yeah. If there isn't a box at all, but instead of free, free for all, then your child who loves order and accountability is going to feel lost. Mm -hmm. So you get where I'm going. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. If you want to be the most effective teacher for your children, you need to pick and choose based on your children. Mm -hmm. their needs, their age, their individual learning styles, their abilities, their strengths, their weaknesses. And yeah. you need to pick and choose based on your philosophy, your beliefs, your passion, your Christian worldview, and what you want to teach. What is going to excite you? And yeah. sometimes that means that if you buy the box, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. It meets all your needs. And sometimes that means that the box is not. And sometimes... Yeah. Well, here's what I discovered. When I started out and held in my hands the traditional Christian curriculum that my children did in the Christian school, mm -hmm. when I started picking and choosing, I didn't throw it all out. Yeah, exactly. I kept pieces of it mm -hmm. because traditional worked perfect in spelling and reading comprehension for my kids. Yeah. So I kept that. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I didn't keep the math in that curriculum, but I did choose <laughs> another math that also leaned towards traditional. I threw out the reading program from that curriculum because my sons were great readers. And instead, I went with Biblioplan because it included classical history, geography, literature, and writing. Right. I threw out the science and went with the unit study focused science. Mm -hmm. And we did a combination of Charlotte Mason and classical for writing. And we unschooled. Yeah. Following our hearts and passions. Yeah. So, do you have any tips um, and just like basic advice as parents are like approaching this as, you know, how do I, you know, step by step, what do I need to do and to, to think through this and to, to maybe cover all my bases? <laughs> um, the very first thing you need to do is you need to find out what your state requires. I mean, yes. that, that's, that's, so that, you kind true. of forget that sometimes mm -hmm. and they jump into homeschool and they go, they, they end up missing some mm -hmm. pretty key points. Every state, has requirements that you need to look for. You need to look at what is your state required that you do yeah. and that you have to teach. Um, I'm in Virginia and it's pretty easy. If you have a college degree, you don't have to go through any hoops except you have to get, you have to do um, testing at the end of the year to prove that your child has advanced. Yeah. Um, other than yeah, that, we, we're pretty easy. But a lot a some of the mm -hmm. states are pretty intense. What is, you're in Texas? In Texas, nothing. We don't have to report anything. We just have five basic subjects that we have to teach, but nobody checks in on you. So, <laughs> you know, it's kind of loosey-goosey. Um, but we do have a place on our website where you can check your state law. So, um, so you can go there. And also, we also have reporting requirements for every state that requires it, too. I've got a blog, and I can link those into this um, broadcast helpful. as well because it is helpful you know a lot of people go online and they're like oh this is what i do to homeschool this is the state laws or these are the laws and then they realize this person that answered you know on social media lives in a different state and it's yeah. not their law at all so definitely listen to julia check out your, <laughs> your state, before you start not, yes not exactly your state mm -hmm. okay and then the next thing you do is you have to think about your children what grade are they in if they yeah. are itty bitties, then your choices are vastly different than they're in high, mm. they're in high school. Are they coming from a school where they were behind or, or are they just right. starting out? Do you mm -hmm. have kids who love to read and love to learn and can sit and focus for hours? They could handle traditional classical. Mm -hmm. If they don't love to read and they can't sit for hours, then both of those might just be a little bit not not the best option right exactly you have kids who are movers and shakers and learning ha ha needs to be hands-on and quick and multi-sensory those are your charlotte mason unit study and unschoolers mm -hmm. do you have kids who have learning struggles do you have kids who are auditory learners visual learners kinesthetic actually we we've created mm -hmm. in our in our curriculum biblio plan we have a whole part of our website where we give parents tips for how to use our material That's awesome. if you have kids with all of those issues mm, so that mm -hmm. you, you can take the material and adapt it for all of your kids' special needs. For gifted, yes. we have a whole part of our website showing you how you can take this material and, and make it more advanced or slow it down um, for either your gift or your struggling learners. 
I just wanted to share your website here. I know I'm going to share it at the end too, but it's biblioplan.net if um, net, if you're thinking. Right. I, and and also if you're asking questions or you have a question, make sure you put them in the feed because we're going to talk. We're going to get to those at the end um, after Julia's done sharing all of her great advice. <laughs> so she'll have some extras to answer your questions. So yeah. So all those questions, all you know, all of your questions about your children are going to determine mm -hmm. the direction you need to take. And yeah. and there, the other issue too is that you have some some of you have children that are very different, and mm -hmm. and you need to look at children individually, not just lump them together into one lump sum. Okay. Yeah. So the next thing you have to do is think about you. What kind yes. of future yes. are you? <laughs> Where do your passions lie? Are mm -hmm. you more science and math oriented? Are you language oriented? Are you organized mm -hmm. or are you a free spirit? How much, and, th and this is a huge question. Yeah, How much time is. do you realistically have to teach in a day? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's something that we that's forget. Very, how yes, many children exactly. are in your family and how much are they going to need? If you have mm -hmm. little bitties running around or you have little babies and you're trying to teach those kids, you've got to think about what am I choosing to teach these with these kids? How am I going to mm -hmm. make it? Um, which I do another whole talk called multi-age, multi-grade. We're going to do that in September. You're already on my schedule for that. So, so. Because mom <laughs> yes. find all kinds of things that she can do together as a family so that you're not segregating your kids at different copies and trying to teach them all separately. Yeah, it'll drive you so, crazy. <laughs> yes. Um, some of you think, I can't do this. You may not have an education degree. You may mm -hmm. not be smart in math or science. You may not be a strong reader. Or you may be a lousy writer. Mm -hmm. hey, Mom, just lay aside that fear. You can do this. You just Amen. have to be honest mm -hmm. with yourself. You need to know what your strengths and weaknesses are and what you reasonably can or can't do. Right. Personally, math and science are not my thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even though I have a nursing degree, science, I don't enjoy it. And math, mm -hmm. I'm sixth grade, and that's about as far as I can go. I will not teach past <laughs> sixth grade. Um, it's not my strength. I, yeah. I, I just can't. And so I have to. I had to acknowledge that from the very first day that hmm. this is not something I could do. Um, so I needed to find how am I going to get those holes filled. Fortunately, my husband yeah. is a science math, you know, guru, and so <laughs> he could fill in the math hole in our co-op. Mm -hmm was awesome for science. And so we were oh, able to yeah. throw our kids mm -hmm. in the co-op and get the science hole filled. Um, so that was a win for us. I loved the reading language arts, writing, history, Bible. So that's what I focused on. That was my strength. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was where I, you know, poured my heart into. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's such good advice. State requirements, consider your kids, and then consider yourself. Too many moms leave that out, and that leads to burnout. Um, so I love that you mentioned that. So, so now, what, what next? Okay. Um, what are you going to teach your kids? What are the subjects? Mm. Um, if they're itty-bitties, then what you need to teach them is very different than, what they are in, than, they're, than when they're in high school. Okay? Yes. So if they're in high school... <laughs> Your focus is on what they need to graduate. Mm -hmm. If they just want a standard diploma, then they need a certain amount of credits. And you need to look at that and you, mm -hmm. um, to know what, what is it that I have to teach them. If they're college bound, then they need more. Right. Um, and then and then you've got to go, okay, I'm, I'm thinking high school here. I've got the five philosophies. Some of the philosophies work well. Some of them not so much. Okay, unschooling mm -hmm. becomes much harder at the high school level. It really it's a lot of tracking of time, and yes. I, I did it for one child. So, wow. <laughs> but it's it is a lot. It's time consuming for tracking. Classical yeah. is a great option for high school. Um, if the child has that bent, traditional mm -hmm. is a great option, or you can do a mixture of both of those. Mm -hmm. Unit studies is harder. To do. I did it's one child for that too, so it's yeah, harder. it is possible. <laughs> um, Charlotte Mason is also possible in high school, and of mm -hmm. course, you can mulligan stew it. You can do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, check out your state requirements for whether a child can start high school in eighth grade. And I'm not a big proponent of pushing your kids through. I did that, and I hmm. regret it big time. I wish I hadn't. That's good um, advice. But yeah. when the, the benefit of starting in eighth grade is that it gives you an extra year mm -hmm. to, to add things in. Um, yeah. 
and and then you can you know or you can slow down and you don't have to cover everything quite so fast if you start in exactly. april you need to check out your your um your state because mm -hmm. some states will only let you start high school in certain subjects um so you mm -hmm. kind of need to know what you're doing there right. um now if they're itty bitties if they're little k to ones the just starting out babies you have two priorities mama reading and math those mm. are the fundamentals in the olden days. It was called reading, writing, and arithmetic. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Math and learning, um, math and learning to read trump history. Now mm -hmm. I realize that I sell a history literature curriculum, so it might seem funny to say what I just said. Mm -hmm. So when I when I go to conventions, and I have a lot of new moms and dads coming into my booth, and they've got the little itty bitties. And they've got the deer in the headlights look and they're just like <laughs> so overwhelmed. Yes. Don't uh -huh. know which direction they're gonna take. When I see that look and I say, What grade what ages are your kids? And they say, My kindergarten or first grade. Mm -hmm. um, I just like set my books aside. So we're not gonna look at this right now. Tell me what you're doing for reading. Yeah. And tell me mm -hmm. what you're doing for math. And and it just they kind of look at me like you're okay and we t mm -hmm. i start talking about it and we process what are you doing and then i'll send them to booths and say go look at that booth go look at that booth mm -hmm. go and, and focus them on reading and math um and i tell them that that history is not priority it's not um, right because we don't memorize things we we you know we as, as they get older our kids just absorb that stuff anyways so many yeah. families, so many moms and dads with those little bitties are so grateful for the grace that gives them to just mm -hmm. relax. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to do everything. You don't have to do science. You don't have to do history. You just you just do that reading, writing, and arithmetic and let them go play outside. You don't yes. have to buy a box. You don't mm -hmm. have to jump right into the philosophies. You just start out slow. You're going to have all the rest of your life to do the rest of it. Yeah. Um, so and that and so that's kind of my thing. So re math and reading are fundamental, and mm -hmm. they're the foundations of everything else. If your child is not reading, then that should be priority. Yeah. So and then, as far as reading, what what kind of advice do you have for that? Um. So I, I am a phonics mama. <laughs> I taught school. I taught first grade for quite a number of years, and um, I've taught all my kids to read. And phonics is like, I just, I, to me, it works. Um, there are a lot of great ones out there. If you find a phonics curriculum you like, but it also has math and reading and history, you don't have to buy the whole box just to get that phonics curriculum. That's good advice. Um, yeah. My attitude is once your child masters the phonics though, or once they master the ability to read, you don't have to stick with that program. Um, some people think, well, I've got this curriculum and I'm following, and I've, I've done the kindergarten books and the first grade books and the second grade books and my kid is tired of it, but mm. do I need to keep going? No, because uh, once they get uh -huh. that reading in, you can split them off and go, okay, now we can, we don't have to stick with this specific reading program because mm. once they're reading, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. um, so my, we did phonics up until first, second grade-ish. Um, it depended upon the child. My strongest readers allowed me to leave phonics faster than my struggling readers. Um, and, and of course, you've got some kids that don't learn best by phonics, and I yeah. get that. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do, then find the program that works for them. Um, yeah. Majority kids do do better with phonics. I'm, I'm just biased that way. <laughs> um, so if you love the Charlotte Mason and classical approach, and you're going, but I want to do the literature books with Charlotte Mason. I want to do the living books. You can. You use them as your as 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 mom readers or as picture books, and you can do right. them alongside. Mm -hmm. But keep but but don't put away the phonics books or the learning to read, along with that. Just bring them alongside you, and yeah. don't round your child. To, don't do quite as many, but you still can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's great advice, and yeah, just following what you have for what, when you need it and then branching out. That's great. So, so that's reading. Now, what about math? Okay. So with math, um, when we started out, when I started out with my boys, there weren't a lot of options out there. Traditional math was pretty much the option. <laughs> but now you have right. a lot of different options. Math needs right. to be determined. And this is really, this, I really believe this math needs to be determined by the specific child. Mm -hmm. You may have six children 
but that all six children might not all learn the same. Yeah. I had one child who would have flourished doing, doing, doing Singapore math if I had known about it. I did not know about mm -hmm. it. I wish I had. Um, I had one child who would have loved and thrived doing Matthew C because that was the kind of kid he was. Right. And, um, if, if I could have, I would have put them both in those two separate programs if I had had mm -hmm. that option back then. I had one child who worked best doing Saxon. In fact, my boys, my older boys, my, my little, my littles, my 15 year olds do Saxon and they do really well with it. Hmm. Um, I had one child who completely bombed out of the DVD based math program. It just did not work. Um, <laughs> so those are four very different math programs, right. very different philosophies. Um, and picking and choosing mm -hmm. is based on your individual child. If you're buying your books from a box, and they're selling a math curriculum that does not fit your child's needs, get out of that box. Go find yeah. something that fits them. Mm -hmm. um, and if it means that you have three different kids in three different math programs, so be it. Yeah. That's the beauty of homeschooling. Exactly. Some moms go, well, I can't do that because I have to pass the books down and save money doing it. Um, and I get that, mom. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if your child is not does not fit that program, then find something that fits them because math is important and teaching to the child's ability is so much better than, than cramming them into a book that doesn't work for them. Yes, it, it is so true. And you can sell it, you can trade it with somebody else at home schools. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of those other options. <laughs> so, but okay, so yeah, we've got, you know, the reading and math definitely fundamental and and then picking you know we you went through the basics of all of all of these different um methodologies but but how do you kind of get down to it and actually pick and choose so that requires some research hmm. um you need to have some ideas of your philosophies okay traditional unit studies classical charlotte mason unschooling free spirit uh -huh. um, you need to know which ones, which, where do you lean? Which way are you leaning? Hmm. Um, and then, and then where you have a direction you can head. Even if, even if you just say, I want to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, uh -huh. decide which road or roads you want to head down. Um, but beware hmm. that there are pros and cons to each philosophy. So I just want to go That's through that. That's good to know. Way. Yes, um, please. So for traditional, traditional is simple and easy and straightforward. It's just hmm. open the book and go. For high schoolers, it's a good option. Testing and grading is simple to do. It looks good on a transcript, hmm. um, but it's not gonna fit that active child. It doesn't often take into account the learning styles of your particular child. It right. may be too dry. Hmm. Um, it may be too test focused. Um, and especially right. if you're learning, children with learning struggles or, or um, struggling learners and, and, and those kinds of kids, traditional sometimes really stumbles them up, especially if the focus is on testing. Yeah. Um, and it mm -hmm. may be too hard to do if you have multiple children doing multiple subjects. Right. Um, it traditional is very is really hard if you have <laughs> five different, you know, kids that you're doing this history and you're doing this history and you're doing this history it makes it really hard. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's your pros and cons of traditional unit studies. Um, they encourage creativity. They allow you to go in deep and immerse mm -hmm. in subjects. They appeal right. to different learning styles. So those le those special needs learners really like learning le unit studies. Especially they the ones bring, that don't transition well. They like yep. to stay on that focus for a long time. <laughs> yep. They bring families together, mm. but they sometimes leave holes or gaps in learning. Yep. Um, students mm -hmm. don't always right. know how to tie unit studies together. So if you're doing mm -hmm. unit studies in history, they don't know how those pilgrims go with those, you know, with the Revolutionary War. It's just two mm -hmm. separate subjects and they have, they don't know how to pull that together in a history chronology. Right. Um, unit studies can also be expensive mm -hmm. and they can require a lot of parent planning. Yes. Um, and it's also hard to determine exactly what's been learned in unit studies. Um, because a lot of them don't come with tests. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's unit studies classical. It gets children learning and thinking critically. It encourages question asking and wrestling with beliefs and worldview. It takes into consideration the stages of development, mm -hmm. your your early, your middle. I mean, your um, your grammar stage, your logic stages, your middle schoolers, your rhetoric stage, your high schoolers. It's super strong in reading and history, and it's very language focused. But mm -hmm. 
it can also be very intense and rigorous and focus on higher minded learning. Um, and it can burn kids out. And yeah. I've seen classical burn children out. Mm -hmm. you, know, so you need to you need to be careful with it. And I have a classical curriculum. Um, and so, you know, I, I recognize that it that, that it can definitely burn. Mm -hmm. um, Charlotte Mason is built around family and family time. It's rich in literature mm -hmm. and history and active learning. It encourages questioning and curiosity, but it tends to require a lot of parent planning. This is another one that you got to do right. a lot of mom work. It focuses on the arts over sciences and math, making it harder for college bound students. Um, using only living books, which is the Charlotte Mason philosophy, uh, means you may not be able to fill in the gaps in their learning. If you're just reading living books without some kind of spines to pull it together, um, it, can, it, it can leave gaps. And Charlotte mm -hmm. Mason can also be a rather expensive way to go as you're pulling and piecing it all together. Right. You end up with a huge library in your house. Yes. <laughs> yes. We're visiting the library every week. <laughs> <laughs> Unschooling meets children where they are. It encourages play and active pursuit in areas of interest. It gives students a love for learning, but it assumes that all children pursue worthy areas of interest and not necessarily do all kids pursue worthy areas of interest. Um, I had one that did. I had one that if we followed him um, and all of his interests, we he we would if we had just unschooled him, he would have learned tremendous amount. I had mm. one that didn't. He that wasn't his bent. Um, so we would have we would have just dropped off the cliff in terms of homeschooling. Um, <laughs> unschooling can go overboard on child led if the child isn't leading in good directions. It requires mm. a lot of parental planning to make teachable moments out of what the child is pursuing. So if you right. mulligans do it, you can pick and choose from the above, going with their strengths and weaknesses and working around them. Yeah, that's, that's so true. I, I love how you, you kind of pulled that together. It really, and it's every, every family is gonna have a different taste as to what tastes good. So um, so I love that you, you combine that with stew because, um, and all the little pieces don't have to be glamorous either. I mean, like you started out with that story, um, but when they come together, it's perfect, it's filling, it's everything that you need. Um, so, you know, in thinking about your, your, your biblio plan, that the curriculum that um, you've developed off of, um, how do these different philosophies kind of come together in that? Um. Biblio Plan was originally billed as a classical history and literature curriculum, so that's mm. what we call it. Um, that's what the original owners called it, and that's what we called it. It was based on the well-trained mind philosophy. Okay. Um, but when we, you know, because of my personality, when we um, when we started writing it and adding in stuff, yeah. um, I tended to be I tend to have more of a Charlotte Mason thought patterns. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to share her philosophy, even though I didn't even know it was out there. Right. Um, much of our material is built around the Charlotte Mason attitude, living books, hands-on, very short lessons, art, narration, child-focused writing. Mm. Um, but it's also built around unit studies. You get huh. to immerse in cultures, you get to immerse in countries to your heart's delight. We do, our craft book is just rich. Hmm. We have notebooking that you can do. So you, you, can, oh, you can really neat. go in deep. And we, mm -hmm. we've designed our, our scope and sequence so that you are able to um, like spend time, like you spend a unit in, in Egypt, you spend a unit in Rome. So Love even that. though it's chronological, you, we did it in a way that allows mm -hmm. you to immerse in, 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 in a unit study kind of feel. Um, it's also traditional. We have mm -hmm. um, children can read the text, they can answer questions, they can take tests. Um, so it is a little bit of this and a little bit of that um and and that's kind of my that's kind of my personality and that's kind of how we have designed and written the curriculum right so you you basically have an eclectic curriculum yes. <laughs> yes. that's, that's awesome <laughs> so if you're feeling a little lost maybe you want to check out um Super. julia's site um and if you're listening be just because i know we we turn this into a podcast at, as well julia's website again is biblioplan it's b-i-b-l-i-o-p-l-a-n dot net 
So, um, and those links will be on the YouTube description um, along with any other links that we talked about in this video, just so that um, you know um, how to get to those really quickly. Um, and again, we're, we're going to have a Q&A time at the end. So if you have questions um, for Julia, definitely put those in the feed right now um, and make sure that you have them ready to go so that when we were wrap, wrap up with what she's sharing that we can jump right into those. Um, so I'm in, interested in to hear, you know, what, what directions you went with your own children, you know, as you, because this seems like it's been a, a progressive thing. <laughs> Yes. So um, with my, my two older ones, especially, I lean towards classical for history. Mm -hmm. I wanted history and geography and Bible to be the absolute center of our schooling. That was the best part of our day. Mm. I wanted the kids to see history unfold. Um, yeah. I wanted them to see God's story unfold. I wanted them to be able to think critically. Mm. I wanted them to wrestle with what they believed. I wanted yeah. them to love history and that meant I wanted to immerse them in living books. Hmm. Uh, and I did. I tended to over drown them. I, I, did, <laughs> I, I did too many, honestly. Um, but the living books was both classical and Charlotte Mason. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted their books to tie into the history that they were reading because um, yeah. I wanted them to make connections so that it would sink in right. and they would retain it. And I mm -hmm. felt like that's the best way to retain it. Yeah. I also wanted them to immerse in cultures. And so we did, mm -hmm. we did the unit studies. Um, I, I was just, I love geography. Geography is like one of my favorite things. Mm. We did a tremendous amount of that. Um, and as, as part of our history, we did a lot of um, hands-on activities. We did cultural food, games, all of that stuff. Fun. Um, for science, we did unit studies mm. until they hit mm -hmm. um, eighth grade. And then they had to do the serious, you know, high school level science. Right. But up until then mm -hmm. we did, we were, um, did unit studies and I was really grateful that our co-op was unit study focused with science too. Mm, so we were able mm -hmm. to do that. Um, Biblioplan, our curriculum doesn't cover grammar, spelling and vocabulary. I tend to choose to go in the traditional d direction for all of those. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wanted my kids to learn a language. And so I, I kind of did that little bit of this, and a little bit of that and tried this and <laughs> ran into walls and everything. Kind of we did the same did. thing. <laughs> I ended up, my favorite was a classical based um, um, language that we did that was in upper hmm. middle, upper elementary and middle school. That was probably my best, my favorite one that we did. But language, I was all over the place. Yeah. So. I, I never found anything from my older two that really worked. But my younger one, she's had a private tutor. <laughs> And they are each other's best friends, and that has worked. And it's fortunately been rather economical for me because she was a homeschooled student and she doesn't charge me a lot. She even lived okay. in Japan for a year teaching English oh, wow. and taught my daughter French from Japan. So, <laughs> so that that is uh, when you when you get that type of arrangement, you don't let it go. But um, but I, language is really difficult. I have to agree. So, um, so. What about finding curriculum? I know we have them listed on our website. Um, we have partners, and you are one of our partners listed on our website. Um, but but where else can families go? Because I know there's a lot of free stuff out there too, and, and a lot of really good written curriculum like yours. Yeah, googling internet searches. If you are Google Charlotte Mason, you're going to come up with a whole bunch of of options. Classical, you are. Um, one good place to go is to go to Kathy Duffy's reviews. Yes. She, Kathy Duffy is, um, does reviews of curriculum and she's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some, there's some of her reviews are the best, I consider the best because she doesn't get paid for her reviews. Mm -hmm. um, so they tend to be very honest. Mm -hmm. um, convention halls, if you can go to a convention, um, go. I'm if hoping right they're now, starting this year again. <laughs> you know, focus keeping people away, which is really sad because it is mm -hmm. the best way to get your hands on it. Um, right. Another Flip good the page. way <laughs> is to go on Facebook and go into forums. Um, there are tons of homeschooling groups out there on Facebook. You can join curriculum specific groups. Our curriculum has a Facebook group called Biblioplan Users. Mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of people who join just because they want to know about the curriculum. So they join to ask questions. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. that's a really great way to find out about stuff. So you can go on and say, hey, what's the best math program? And people will mm -hmm. jump right in and tell you what their ideas are. Um, yeah. Word of mouth is probably the biggest and most important way to learn for, about curriculum. 
Mm-hmm. It's our biggest source of advertisement. Um, yeah. It was the biggest way I learned about the material I ended up using. Hmm. So here's mm-hmm. my thing though. If you hear something positive about a curriculum, then by all means, check it out. It may yeah. not fit your style and that's okay, but kind words spoken over it, they're worth hearing. But yeah. here's my other word of caution. Um, if someone gives you negative words about a curriculum, hmm. um, as someone who's been around the block, sometimes people are harsh towards a curriculum because they didn't like the cover or they didn't fully understand it. Right. Um, sometimes people yeah. are harsh because they are biased towards their own box and they hmm. want to their box. Yes. Um, sometimes they're harsh because it doesn't fit their philosophy. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're harsh because it didn't fit work for them. Right. Don't always assume that that's a reason to just throw that curriculum out the door or not even give it a time of day. If you're right. interested in something and your friend blows it off, don't just take their word for it. Mm-hmm. Take the time and honor the writers of that curriculum by giving them your time and effort. Most of the vendors that, that are out right. there, especially all of us little mom and pop vendors, we're working mm-hmm. our hearts out. Let's look at what we've got. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many, I, I'm friends with so many of the vendors out there and I know their hearts and just, mm-hmm. just give them the time of day and say, hey, show me what you've got or, or go on their website and look at it. Right. Um, I've seen too many people pass a curriculum that would work for them because their friends swayed them in the other direction. Don't be a lemming. Just yeah. you know, think think it out yourself. Word of mm-hmm. mouth is powerful. It can sway you. If it's positive, that's wonderful. Um, if it's negative, sift and ponder. We are way less discerning if something negative has been spoken over something. Yeah. So a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. You can pick and choose. Don't be overwhelmed. Focus on what's the most important yeah. um, and have fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's it, you have to have fun. Otherwise, um, you know, it's going to be a drudgery for everyone in the house. You know, if mom ain't happy, yeah. nobody's happy. <laughs> right. And it's okay to say that this didn't work. Yeah, I said stuff didn't and, work. I threw stuff out halfway through the year. Says this is not working. Yep. And boom, out out it went. You know, yep. sell it on eBay. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to be actually starting reviews on our website. We're going to be doing unboxings um, and um, we have, we're doing a a standard form so that you'll be able to know if it works for struggling learners and if, you know, as far as executive functioning and all these other things. So we're taking into consideration a lot of things that our parents would just because they can't get their hands on materials. So um, our first review should come out sometime next month. We've just got some for our team and we're going to be rounding up a review crew so if that interests you in our audience to um to get some curriculum and and do that um that may be um something to to think about as well so um we've got a couple questions i'm gonna pick and choose because we've got only about seven minutes left um so Hello, everybody watching. I most looks like most people are on YouTube. Um, so Michelle asked, I have a six and eight year old in full time ABA. So that's applied behavior um, therapy. And I'm having trouble figuring out expectations for homeschooling because that's that's mostly functional skills um, versus and I, I know you've got kids that that are struggle too. So you probably understand a little bit of that. But um, where to start, you know, especially at those ages. I mean, when you talk about reading and, and math, um, how, how should she approach that? Just simple, simple. Go, go, just reading, especially if you have an eight, it is your, I, I wish I could ask. <laughs> well, you can ask and see if she responds, because I mean, she just put that question up, so. I, but, I don't see the question, so. Okay. Yeah, that just came up a couple minutes ago. I'm not sure how to get them up. Um, I, I would I would just go really simple. I would I'll just focus here. again on your on your reading and math, um, and and start there and and then go from there. So you because you're and and I would also make like with your six and eight year old. I would try to find things that are as close that you can do as much together as you can because mm. that'll relieve some of the stress. So yeah. if you can if you do pick science, do something that's just easy that you can do together. Um, you're doing you know if you can do anything together that's that makes it easier Mm -hmm. um but i would i would just definitely be focused on my my little cat has decided to join me (laughs) pop him off the the chair um focus on the reading and the math 
Yeah, yeah, and I think we do get so stressed. And, and, you know, as those things come in that, you know, that life skills that you just feel like need to be teached, you know, you teach them and you yep. focus on those those main ones. I used to say the things that agitated me the most about my kids was the, the character lessons we needed to focus on that week. <laughs> so. And having fun, they're little, just mm -hmm. have fun. If you only teach for a couple hours, you know, if you get that and then just so the true. rest of the day do a lot of, do a lot of play, do a lot of um, creative stuff, um, you know, just have fun. Yeah, yeah, so true. I had one other question, and, and um, this may wrap up our time, but she asked if there were any recommendations, uh, books written by authors of color, um, preferably without deeply embedded Christian themes, but, I mean, feel free to share what you want to share, um, whether it has a Christian theme or not. Um, <laughs> So that, that's kind of a hard question, okay? So can I yeah. say the question again? Oh, sure. Um, a sure. lot of it depends upon your age. Uh, Biblio Plan is a, is a literature curriculum. I mean, it's history literature, and we mm -hmm. have like hundreds of books on our book list, hundreds. And um, we, I, I don't know how many of my authors are, um, I have a lot of authors that are, are um, multiracial, um, but I couldn't tell you how many. Mm. Um, I would venture to say that, you know, a lot of our books are Christian based, but a lot of our books are not. So it's kind mm -hmm. of all over the place. We, we, um, we try to find a wide variety. Um, right. So, you know, it, we are both history literature. So you're gonna, um, you know, you're, you're gonna get lots of options. Every week you have about three or four options of books per age range. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of books. Yeah. But I, um, I don't have any specific authors that I can pull off the top of my head at this point. <laughs> right. No, it's getting late for you. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, and what you, you said at the beginning, too, about saying, you know, when you gravitate towards these different curriculums, you're going to gravitate towards things that go with your 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 own, you know, worldviews and all these other things. So you're going to be pulling from things that that you've collected in your house or, you know, or that you're looking at that will make an eclectic mix kind of in the direction of your own teaching philosophy and all those other things. So I, I love when you, when you said that kind of towards the beginning of when we were talking and wanted to just um, reiterate that because I think that's important. That but our book, our book lists are very um, diverse. We have a tremendous amount of books um, that, that are very, um, that cover cultural um, right, and especially if you're doing geography and 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 other things like that, you have to. So yeah, I mean, we look for them. So if mm -hmm. we can find books that that are multicultural, that are um, you know other races and stuff like that, as we stick it in, we stick everything yeah. in. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Again, um, if you want to find out more about uh, Biblio Plan and the. Julia's um, and her husband's curriculum. You can um, check out her website at biblioplan.net. And just want to thank you, Julia. This has been um, this has been wonderful. I you know I've never heard anybody so concisely um, put together. This is what you have to think through. This is this is how all the approaches. They're, they're pluses. They're minuses. What you can take out of it um, to make it fit. This is great. Um, Thank you. So I appreciate all that you had to share. And I am looking forward to you coming back in September because <laughs> we are going to talk about multi-age teaching. So that is on the schedule. So if you um, don't know, on our website, we do have a whole broadcast schedule. Um, ju I just added all the February um, broadcasts, except for one. I'm still working on that. Um, but we're going to focus on IEPs or individual education plans or student education plans. How do you do that? How do you write them? What do you do if you're emergency homeschooling and you want to get back to the IEP at school at some point? Um, hopefully when COVID stuff is over. Um, anyways, we're going to focus on a lot of that stuff. But um, next week, we're going to finish up teaching methodologies and we're going to talk about um, teaching a struggling learner using a literature rich curriculum. And so, um, so yeah, I, and my guest is one of our past team members who um, has kids with dyslexia and uses a literature-based curriculum. So she's going to have a lot to share with how do you teach children who don't read well with books? <laughs> so um, that should be a lot of fun. But um, anyways, so so thank you again, Julia. I You're appreciated welcome. your I your time. You your wisdom and it was wonderful having you thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again 
right here next week on Empowering Homeschool Conversations, same time, same place. So we'll see you then. Have an awesome week, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.